Right, everyone, welcome to DataCon LA 2021. My name is Dimas, and I will be your host. And we have Depender as our co host for today's keynote session. Today, this year, will mark our ninth year data conference and the second virtual conference for us. DataCon LA has been growing from a few hundred to thousands of attendees and community members. This conference is the brainchild of our fearless leader, Subhash D'Souza. It is organized and supported by a community of volunteers, sponsors, and speakers. Mm -hmm. DataCon LA features the most vibrant gathering of data technology enthusiasts in Los Angeles. DataCon LA has become the largest data conference in Southern California, thanks to you guys. So today is our first day of DataCon LA, and we're going to kick it off with a message from Eric Garcetti, the mayor of LA, and the ambassador-elect to India. Eric Garcetti is a fourth generation Angelino and the 42nd mayor of Los Angeles. Born and raised in San Fernando Valley, the son of public servants and the grandson of great grandson of immigrants from Mexico and Eastern Europe, Mayor Garcetti's life has been shaped by a deep commitment to the core values of justice, dignity, equality for all people. So here I bring you his message. Hello, I'm Mayor Eric Garcetti, and it's my great honor to welcome you to DataCon 2021. Collecting, interpreting, and visualizing data allows us to understand the story of our collective lives. In the 15th century, Luca Pacioli used double entry bookies to tell the fortunes of the city's merchant class. John Snow mapped cases of cholera in 1850s London and demonstrated how the water carried this disease. Today, big data helps health officials prevent new polio viruses from emerging and helps employers fight against hiring bias. In my eight plus years as mayor, innovative applications of data science have helped Los Angeles keep our streets clean with our clean stat map. It's connected parents and students to an incredible number of opportunities through our learn, earn, and play app. Data tells us what we've done and expands our understandings of what we can do. Throughout this pandemic, quality data directed public health decisions about where to deploy vaccine and testing sites to find sickness sooner and spread wellness faster. It literally saved lives. So I hope that this gathering sparks new questions about what we can record and what it helps us to know. And I hope that you talk to someone who helps you see things in a new way and maybe even works with you on answering those new questions. Thank you for being part of DataCon. I can't wait to see what we will figure out together in the years ahead. All right, so our first keynote speaker is our is Ron Galperin. He's independently elected controller of the city of Los Angeles. Galperin oversees a team that audits municipal departments and programs, manages payroll and spending, reports on city's finances, pursues fraud and waste, and works to create a more transparent, accountable, equitable, and modern government for everyone. Galperin launched Control Panel LA, the city's first open data portal in 2013. During the pandemic, he created LA Equity Index to help address local barriers to opportunity and released a series of resource maps and financial dashboards to eight businesses and residents. Please welcome Ron. Good morning, I'm LA controller Ron Galperin and I'm so pleased to join you again for this year's DataCon LA. And uh, thank you so much to uh, Subhash D'Souza and to everybody for being a part of making this happen. Um, it's one of my favorite events of the year uh, because it really brings together the best and the brightest uh, in data. And I'm honored to uh, be a part of that. Uh, now more than ever, after a year and a half of living through the pandemic, we've seen the value of data and its ability to transform the way that we deliver information and resources to the public and the way that we make decisions. Now, data in and of itself is neither good nor bad, uh, but I am passionate about the ability of data to be a force for good to better the work we do in government, to improve and even save lives. And much like this year's conference theme, Data for Good, 
Uh, my office has used this time as an opportunity to leverage data and expand access to much needed resources during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, in our few moments, I'd like to talk briefly about uh, the background of my role as controller and what our office does, uh, a little bit about the role of government uh, and data, and third, to give you an overview of some tools and resources that my office has made available, especially during this time of COVID-19. As controller, I'm the elected watchdog. It's my job to oversee the people's finances and uh, our spending and our operations. Alas, despite my title, I do not control it all, but it is my job to uh, keep the finances of the city in a uh, form of control. And all the money that's paid out in salaries and benefits to city employees comes through my office, payments made to vendors, uh, and uh, we also do financial reporting, audits, as was mentioned, uh, reports on departments, and we really delve into them and see how are they using data and what is it that they are uh, doing with it. Now, as a public official, I see it as my job to make as much information as possible available. And I really think of it as radical transparency. And I sought to open up the windows, the doors, the skylights of uh, the city so that everybody could really be a judge of how we're spending the money. And also everybody could actually look at the data of what it is that we are uh, uh, performing and how it is that we are delivering services. Uh, I created lacontroller.org. You'll see it on your screen here right now. Uh, it includes the uh, control panel LA, uh, which has the virtual checkbook of the city. Every single payment for the last uh, 10 years, millions of those payments are in there. You can see the vendor, uh, you can see the payment authorization, and uh, you can uh, download it, you can Facebook it, you can tweet it, you can do all those things. You can see the payroll for every one of the people who work for the city of LA, payroll period by payroll period the breakdown of how much of it is base, how much of it is uh, for uh, overtime, and much, much more. Um, we also created uh, this uh, city finances dashboard that you see here, and it's an online dashboard in real time that tells you about the city's 800 different funds, uh, how they are performing. Uh, you can look at each of the departments and how they're doing on budget versus actual. Uh, you can look at performance data and much, much more. Um, it's really kind of unprecedented. I'm proud to say that no other city has something quite so extensive as we do in LA. And it's meant to be used by those who are working within the city, as well as uh, those who are advocates and activists and just people who are actually interested in what's happening. Uh, because COVID-19 uh, was a rollout of a lot of spending very, very quickly, uh, we also created a COVID-19 spending tracker. Uh, this tracks uh, uh, more than a billion dollars of COVID-related expenditures by the city, including where $745 million that we got in CARES Act money goes. You can look at it, again, by department. You can look at it in how much PPE did we, uh, did we buy, what kind of uh, PPE did we get, uh, supplies, uh, overtime, staffing, and much, much more. And it's, again, really a way to hold government accountable. Um, along the lines of COVID-19, what we also launched was a COVID-19 dashboard uh, tracking the virus uh, day by day by day. Uh, and you can look at it by race, by ethnicity, by gender, by age. You can see where are the hot spots. We've also overlaid it with data about vaccinations. So we can see where is it that the greater focus needs to be in terms of where people still need those vaccinations. And eventually, by the way, uh, perhaps booster shots as well uh, versus uh, where uh, they're actually getting it and lots of other data specifically about COVID and uh, hundreds of resources for people uh, that they can click on. Um, I'm a real lover of uh, maps and uh, dashboards, and a number of the recent uh, maps that we've uh, issued include one looking at illegal dumping. And by the way, anybody in Los Angeles, unfortunately, can attest to the fact that we see it everywhere. And uh, what we've done is collect the data on it, look at it neighborhood by neighborhood, what kind of stuff is being dumped, uh, what the patterns are, and how do we do better enforcement, how do we do better prevention, uh, how do we prevent uh, so much of 
uh, this illegal dumping that we see all over Los Angeles. And we've all seen it. It's construction materials. It's sometimes uh, sofas. Uh, it is all sorts of stuff that are being uh, thrown away, uh, but are not being done so uh, legally. And we've also done an audit looking at the 311 service of the city. Many of you may know that's the phone number you call or the app that you use. And we've gathered all the data to look at what kind of requests are being made, how quickly are those requests being uh, processed uh, in tremendous detail, uh, and it's all the way down to the smallest neighborhood level. And we've also mapped all of the uh, homeless housing projects that are being financed by Triple H. That's the bond measure approved by voters now five years ago. It's been very slow. I've quite frankly been a critic of how long it's taken, but what the map does is really shed light on uh, where we've been successful and where unfortunately we have not been. Um, as I think we all know, there's a real emphasis that we need to have in our city and across our nation on equity. Uh, there are tremendous inequities uh, that we see in every community. And so what I did is create the first ever equity index, gathering data from a lot of different sources. And you can look at uh, every neighborhood in Los Angeles and uh, examine what is the percentage of renters versus owners, percentage of people who are health insured, education levels, air quality, uh, a whole long variety of different data points so that we can make better decisions about how monies are going to be invested and where we need to put our resources. Now, let me say that all this data is great, but we've also got to be careful with it. We as a city have a mountain of sensitive data, uh, including taxpayer information, health information gathered by paramedics, crime-related information, uh, and now lots of camera and scanning data. Uh, and I recently uh, issued a report about how do we protect your privacy when we have so much data. As a matter of fact, we have uh, nearly 900 hours of police body camera footage. We've got 3.6 million license plates that are read and scanned automatically. Uh, we've got nearly 12,000 surveillance cameras. We've got drone deployments. We've got traffic data that is processed daily. But we have to figure out a way to use that data for good, but also make sure that it is not misused. And that's also going to be, I think, one of the great challenges that we in government face. So we have to remember that data is absolutely essential and can do so much good, uh, but we have to make sure how as government we actually do that. And that's the toughest part because data like technology is really neutral. Uh, what is not is how it is used. I, I really wanna thank uh, my team at the controller's office uh, so you're just seeing a small little taste of what it is that we do with a tiny little staff, and uh, they are really transforming our city with data. And I love the partnerships that we have with many different organizations, uh, including with Datacon. And I wish you a great conference. And uh, my advertisement for the day is check us out at lacontroller.org. Sign up for our emails for our Twitter, for our Facebook, uh, for our Instagram, and much more. And uh, we look forward to not just communicating with you, but to hearing back from you with your ideas, your thoughts about how to continue to make Los Angeles a better and better place each day. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Gonna... <clears throat> All right. So, um, our next keynote speaker is Karen Barkervink. She is the executive director of the nonprofit LA Tech for Good, where she leads a team of over 20 volunteers in strengthening technology as a force of social change. The organization has focused attention on data equity and ethics since DataCon last year. As these, these issues become increasingly more crucial to address, 
Her talk this morning will draw lessons about data justice from Afghanistan to Brooklyn and offer recommendations on how you can be a data equity practitioner. Karen, the stage is yours. Volunteers and sponsors who made this happen. And I wanna give a special shout out to Subash. Uh, I know it's been a challenging year and here we go. DataCon 2021. I'm Karen, I lead LA Tech for Good. We're a nonprofit strengthening the Tech for Good ecosystem. I wanna start with a story. Um, a decade ago, I was downsized from entertainment and I was making a huge career shift. So I, volu but I volunteered at Social Media Week because I had no money to buy a ticket. And it was there that I got my very first glimpse of technology and support of social causes, something I really was not aware that ha was, could happen. To, frankly, um, I saw an online community built for day, for day laborers. I saw a video platform to tell the stories of homeless people and more. Little did I know at that time that I would be here now as a founder leading a nonprofit advocating technology for social change. Maybe you will be similarly, similarly inspired this weekend. All of us are part of a gigantic social phenomenon and shift that is driven by data. It's been called the Wild West, which if you're not familiar with that term, was a US, US expansion from the East Coast to the West, where native peoples were exterminated, gunslingers and cowboys ruled. It was a general free for all. So I'm pretty sure you're aware of issues of bias, privacy, even spying that are part and parcel of this new data world across machine learning, AI, facial recognition, and big data. Today, I wanna to ask every single one of you to engage in and step up your work for data justice. Whether you're a CEO, a data scientist, or an academic, understanding the policies and practices behind data is super important so we can change them for the better and mitigate damage being done. If you work in big data or a corporate environment, we ask you to raise a flag uh, on things that seem harmful. If you go to a university, we ask you to insist on data ethics coursework. Your work will make a difference. Sharpen your data equity lens in both analytics and practice, regardless of where you're at. It is critical in today's world and advocate for others to do the same. There's some basic ethics of data, basic principles of data ethics that I hope many of you are aware of. Whose data collected on, for what purpose, what data points are gathered and what data points are not gathered. What consent is given or not, who decides and more. The one principle I'm going to mention today is the principle of who owns the data. In my mind, I titled this talk, Data Ethics from Afghanistan to Brooklyn, because I have two examples at opposite ends of the spectrum. You've probably heard that biometrics data and devices were left behind when the US uh, departed Afghanistan. I was thinking a whole lot about this at the same time I was, as I was starting to frame these remarks. I tried and tried to figure out how to view that situation because there were problems with the biometrics thing across all equity measures. But the thing that struck me and what I consider the bottom line in that particular situation is that it was basically a transfer of data ownership from the US to the Taliban. Um, to just touch on it for a moment on the scope of all this, there are at least four major Afghan biometric databases generally developed in close collaboration with the US military, whose stated goal with one of them was to record biometrics on 80% of the Afghan population. Now that's 25 million people. You have to ask yourself for what purpose? So these biometrics all quite frankly, completely excluded the Afghan people whose biometrics were being collected. They had no consent, ownership or agency over their personal data and its use. This certainly could be called the human rights issue, especially there in other, in other parts of sharp global conflict. This is a timely and even life or, de life or death example of what happens when individuals' data is not in their own hands. Then in contrast, I wanna call your attention to Brooklyn because it was there that residents of a apartment complex called the Atlantic Plaza Towers pushed back when the building owner tried to require facial recognition so that residents could enter their own homes. Their resistance forced the owner to back down. We do not want to be tagged like animals. We should be able to freely come in and out without you tracking every movement, said one, time, one long time resident. 
This kind of activity is perhaps a too rare occurrence these days, but average folks stood up against tech as a form of control and access to their own homes even. Don't we want to see more of this type of thing? I hope that you are all data literate on these issues, but you still probably know folks who say what's wrong with facial recognition. And of course, many of you are probably using it right now on your phones. Data consequences, as we know, come down harder on black and black people and people of color, from law enforcement and racial profiling to redlining and job applications. Niger Parks was held 10 days in a New Jersey jail. Robert Williams, 30 hours in a Detroit jail. Michael Oliver, also of Detroit, was charged with a felony count of larceny. All three were black men falsely accused of crimes in recent years based on facial recognition algorithms. The bottom line is that huge gender, race, and skin color bias are built into facial recognition and into data and tech overall. And this has huge negative consequences in people's lives. So do you personally work with data? If so, we have some suggestions on how to develop your own data equity practice. There are many good and complementary frameworks that you can reference. Women, especially black women and women of color, both practitioners and academics have stepped up as leaders in data justice. We recommend their work. I wanna highlight two resources. One is the documentary Coded Bias, and that's certainly valid whether you're a data practitioner or a, or a lay person. It features Joy Bulamwini, a scientist at MIT who discovered the facial recognition software did not see her dark face. And then she went on to build the Algorithmic Justice League and more. It's also this documentary that tells the story of the Atlantic Plaza, Plaza Towers in Brooklyn. Be sure to check it out. It's still on Netflix and it's really outstanding. The second resource I want to mention is Data Sheets for Datasets. This is by Tim Neat Gabriel and others. This is both a recommendation that data sheets accompany every single data set, and it's a tool for making them. Data sheets that document motivation, composition, collection process, recommended uses, and so on. LA Tech for Good has found this to be very valuable in our, in our workshops, and we strongly recommend that you uh, use it and implement it in your data practice. I'd also ask you, ask you to support these data leaders. There are two views getting played out in, in the public spheres these days. On the one hand, 60 Minutes entirely cut Bulamini out of their feature on facial recognition. But on the other hand, Olay, the beauty firm, on Monday launched a campaign called Decode the Bias to double the women in STEM and help decode bias in search engines. Over a year has passed since Black Lives Matter and Stop Asian Hate have come on the scene as responses to racism. I would add that data is a place where you can make a difference if you are one of many looking for concrete ways to oppose racism and broader inequalities. So in conclusion, whether you're a data practitioner, data newbie, a nonprofit leader, a career changer, a corporate decision maker, there is a place for you in strengthening data justice. We urge you to discover, engage, collaborate, and innovate. Check out our panel tomorrow uh, on elevating data equity in, in practice. It's at 9.30. We strongly recommend Nithya, Nithya Ramanathan's keynote tomorrow on decolonizing data. And Cindy Lynn of Hopskip Drive is speaking at 10 o'clock on data ethics, data equity and ethics from idea to practice. And those are definitely uh, sessions of DataCon that we recommend. LA Tech for Good host data equity and ethics workshops. We'd love to take one to your company or organization. We posted a few references from this talk on our website, latechforgood.org, and we'll include more. Please join our mailing list, connect with us on LinkedIn, fund our work, and collaborate with the broader Tech for Good community. Thanks for listening. Now go out and change the data world. Oh, I was muted. Um, <laughs> thank you again, Karen. Um, we love what you do for our data community. So our next speaker is Gil uh, Elbaz. He is an accomplished entrepreneur and pioneer of natural language technology and structured data ecosystems. In 1991, Gil earned his bachelor's degree from Caltech with a double major in engineering, applied science, and economics. 
1998, he co-founded Applied Semantics, or ASI. The company was acquired by Google in 2003, at which point Gil became director of engineering for the Santa Monica office. In 2007, Gil left Google to start Los Angeles-based Factual Incorporated, an open data platform founded to maximize data accuracy, transparency, and availability. Without further ado, here's Gil. Hello, I am Gil Elbaz. Thank you. Thank you, Dimas and Subash also for inviting me to present at this tremendous gathering of data enthusiasts. <clears throat> I, am, I am a seed stage investor at 10110 Ventures. As you heard, I, I've run a couple of venture-backed startups, most recently Factual that's become Foursquare, the location platform. More than anything, though, I think I'm still that kid who in 1983, was dying to get my own PC. And you can maybe guess why. Of course, it was for the database software. You, you see, I, I had been tracking data on paper. I was so curious about patterns of the world, about whether um, I was listening to songs on the radio and wanting to track them, uh, my favorite sports team, stocks, uh, and a lot more. So the database was a game changer. Do you know how hard it is to sort tables on paper, it, it takes time. Uh, so I was hooked, as you can imagine. Um, this conference is filled with amazing presentations about data technologies. My, mes my main message today to you is to build data, build your own proprietary data that can add value to the world. So I don't know if you are going to build data for the same reasons that I did, because it's fun and, and you get to explore the world, uh, more likely you're going to need to build it because your product needs data differentiation. Common wisdom is to start by getting in the head of a particular customer, understand their problem very deeply, design a solution around it. You've, you've heard this, this is very good advice for how to get started. But I think you also have to be aware concurrently that there's a lot more competition today. There's more star, more funded startups, more people looking at that same customer pain point. So I believe it's more important now that your solution has a data moat, ideally a growing data moat, to ensure that your product is smarter, to make sure that that future clone of yours, new competitor on the scene, doesn't doesn't lap you, run circles around you with, with uh, something that's more data driven. So you want to get started early. Now, it can be daunting when you start thinking about wanting to achieve a data advantage when you think about these huge tech companies. And these stats are, are, are crazy these days. If you think about in a single day, how many WhatsApp, 100 billion WhatsApp messages and thousands of years of YouTube video uploaded. Um, Twitter just recently posted a blog post talking about 7.5 billion tweets in a year. Now that's just about K-pop. Uh, so yes, I mean, so even in a specific area, they're gonna have a lot of data to mine. If you're very interested in this, you can check their, their, their blog post and read more about the history of the, all, the, all these metrics on the growth of interest in K-pop, but I digress. This, Discussion is really about my encouraging you to build data. Um, you can do it, uh, you should do it. And I actually think for the sake of the world, you need to do it. I deeply believe that the products you are building today are directly or indirectly taking on the absolute grand challenges of today. So many of the products that you are working on can make the difference between thriving planet, thriving humanity, and maybe a world that tips into chaos. So I think, I think it's very important. And what I wanna do in next here is suggest some of the common approaches that I've seen to start building up your data mode. And it's not that easy, so hopefully this, this will be useful. Um, there are many paths to start starting to build up that data mode. Um, first of all, there is the virtuous circle of data collection and product improvement. Uh, you may have seen this this feedback loop where if you can design a product that can maximize the kind of data that you incent 
your users to share. And then you can build a feedback loop where that data is collected and then used to improve the value proposition to your users. Make, it makes the product better, more innovation. Uh, that should lead to more efficient customer acquisition. More users means more data. Uh, this, is, I, this is terrific. I love seeing companies that have thought through this feedback loop. But sometimes it can be challenging with the cold start problem to get started on, on day one. So some other ideas here. Um, if you have your own hardware and sensors deployed, <clears throat> many companies uh, leverage the sensors on the phone or they, they could build custom hardware and deploy. Uh, it, historically, it's been very capital intensive. Uh, you think about companies putting satellites into space and raising hundreds of millions of dollars to do so. I, I point out the there's a 10.1.10 portfolio company called Urban Sky that's come up with a new idea of micro balloons and unique sensors that can collect imagery at a much more granular than, than satellites. So cheaper, better in some ways. Uh, it's just one example uh, of, of how to do this. Um, Here's a, if you can get your customers to pay for the hardware, like Purple Air has, has managed to do it, to get people to install uh, air quality monitors in your backyard. Well, that's, that's certainly cost effective. I, I care about the air quality. It's looking pretty good as of last night here in LA. Another great thing to look at, especially for a young company that has limited budgets, a nice place to look is open data. Uh, there's a universe of open data published by governments academic institutions, nonprofits. We heard a little bit this morning about LA's extensive resources. Uh, in, two, in 2007, I launched a nonprofit, Common Crawl. It's, it, it offers a massive data set of a couple hundred billion web pages. AWS generously provides a huge amount of storage. It's among the most popular data sets in the registry. And I'd love to see what other organizations are doing with it. Um, most notable recently has been uh, GPT-3, the huge language model built by OpenAPI, which was trained on common crawl data. I was just looking in Hacker News recently, and there's a recent example of this uh, Leon 400 million largest openly available image text pair data set. Uh, it's not that easy to, they use common crawl to find the images, and then they extracted the labels, which is not so easy to do. I, I checked it out. I, I did a search on Puppy. It, seem, it seems to work, and they, and they have the labels. Uh, maybe somebody else in the audience can use this to, to work on some state-of-the-art machine vision model. Uh, running through a few others in my limited time, running a few other modes. Well, of course, these last two examples were great examples of not just using open data to get started, but deriving data and building va valuable der derivatives, which then can be something unique and proprietary, uh, which can be part of your data mode. So plenty of opportunities to use your natural language, your AI machine learning skills to build something new. You can always license third-party data. Uh, sometimes younger companies can get access to free data APIs to validate product ideas before having to sign up for an extent expensive contract. And you know, if you have uh, creative business development skills, partnership skills. I've seen a lot of companies negotiate creative relationships where data can be made available on a non-cash basis, sometimes, sometimes for exchange, sometimes for promoting products. Uh, it's definitely worth having those conversations. Finally, brute force. I don't want to minimize brute force. It's an important tool in your tool chest. At the very least, companies often use brute force methods to build gold standard sets to test the rest of their data to make sure that they have good QA processes. Costs have come way down because it's possible to use outsource teams from companies like Mechan from Amazon Mechanical Turk or Task Us. So uh, a whole bunch of paths here. Now, before I conclude, I just I needed at least one slide to talk about a lot of important issues that have come up. Uh, there, are, th there are challenges with building a, a data moat. There are legal compliance issues, and you do have to become an expert or hire an expert to make sure that you are in compliance, that you have user consent, that you've crafted, you've correctly crafted your terms of service and your privacy policy to explain what you're doing. Even if you do everything right, 
you can still have a PR problem if if people don't feel that what you're doing is proper and appropriate and value add. If you have a clear narrative and you can clearly state to anyone that asks why you're collecting data, how you're processing it, what you're doing with it, and the value you're adding to everyone and to the world, then uh, you shouldn't have a problem. Uh, I appreciate Karen's message about how important it is also to make sure that data uh, doesn't promote bias and discrimination. That's also an important topic to dive into. So I will leave you again with this message of encouragement to build data. Your product needs data differentiation. The world needs your products. And so please, for the sake of humanity, build, build some data. Thank you very much for this chance to speak to you. If you have any exciting data projects, I'd love to hear about them. Here's my email address, gill at 10110.net, and enjoy the rest of this conference. Thanks. Got to make sure I'm um, not muted. All right. Uh, thank you for being our guest, um, Gil, and reminding us how powerful data is, but more so how empowered we are to build a better future. So our next keynote speaker is a Chief Data and Analytics Officer at RepairSmith.com. Dr. Allison Burnham is a career data scientist with more than 25 years of experience spanning large companies, agencies, and startups. Prior to joining RepairSmith, Dr. Burnham served as a data science consultant for a variety of retail and technology clients and was the chief data scientist for Emotely, a social network startup. Please welcome Dr. Burnham. Oh, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate it. Um, so I just want to sort of talk through a few things about myself. So I, I, you know, it's, uh, I have had a long career in, as I say, making information out of data, and that's very carefully chosen words. So let me, let me uh, dive in here. So I talk a bit about myself. Um, I have a PhD in mathematics because the department I was in didn't have a statistics PhD, but I did specialize in statistics. And I just wanna walk you through some job titles. So um, these are actually in order. I started out as a quality control supervisor. Um, the second one is my second favorite job title ever, which was I actually worked for the government and they called me a mathematician. I love telling people that's what I was and showing them my card. Um, you'll see a few of the others, risk analyst, uh, value management architecture, so working in marketing at that point, I, um, director of value management, I've specialized in pricing, I had the CIO title for a while, I ended up getting a job actually that was purely marketing, so analytics was only a small part of it, so that was the customer loyalty one. Back to pricing and now um, chief data and analytics officer at RepairSmith. And, the result of having this incredibly confusing set of uh, job titles is that most people in my life don't really understand what I do, and it's very hard to explain. I've also worked in many industries, so I can't really simplify it by saying, oh, I work in banking or I work in shipping or whatever it is. So just a list here of a few different ones. Um, variety hasn't been a problem in my career at all. Uh, there's you know, online dating was one that I did fairly early on. Um, you know, I always try to experience the customer experience, but that one was a little challenging. But if you think about it, why, when I, 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 would, I would contend that throughout my whole career, I've been basically doing the same thing, uh, which is making information out of data. Why, why do you think I have so many title, different titles? It's a STEM career. If you think about other STEM careers that you know I might have considered early on, they're all pretty clearly defined. You know, engineers, accountants, physicists, even software developers, which I think would be our closest analogy. Titles have evolved in computer science, but they've not been as like all over the place as mine are. And I think 
if I look at it, it's because the idea of data is a bit less concrete. Like everyone's a bit more vague about what data actually is and what analyzing it actually means. So, you know, obviously engineers have fairly concrete things to work on, excuse the pun. Accountants, everyone knows what an accountant does. We all need to keep our own books, but data is, is different. I've actually been in my career and I'm gonna date myself now. Uh, my career actually started in the late 1980s, um, but I've actually seen four waves where data became super popular for a while and everyone was looking for statisticians and it was, it was a good time to be a statistician. So in the 80s, it was all about the Japanese um, revolutionizing manufacturing using statistics that ironically, I'm sure some of you know, actually was uh, based on a lot of work that an American had come over and worked with them on, Dr. Deming, but they perfected it. And, you know, a lot of things came out of that where people were suddenly looking at manufacturing data to make higher quality cars and other, other items. So that wave was pretty big in the 1980s. In the 90s, what what you really saw was a lot of people talking about business intelligence, data warehousing. People were starting to get much smarter about how they collected data so that you could analyze it, and then how you serve that up to business users. And that was super exciting. And business intelligence had a nice ring to it. It sounded pretty smart. In the 2000s, suddenly it was data mining, and we were all on a quest to find the elusive reason why people bought beer and diapers at the same time. We were uh, working on customer segmentation, which funnily enough, I never really thought about when I was working in it, but somebody later on in my career pointed out that it sounds like we're cutting up our customers. But what we were really trying to do was get them into groups that we could market to. Predictive analytics, trying to find that, that, that elusive piece of information that would revolutionize our business. In the 2010s, suddenly we were talking about big data. Everything had exploded. Storage in computers was much cheaper. Data was getting bigger. Data was now being called data science. And we were talking about artificial intelligence, which I would argue artificial intelligence has sort of been a bit of a theme even from the 50s. Um, but you know, occasionally it surfaces right to the top and becomes the thing everyone's talking about. And having seen those three, those four waves sort of go through. Um, I have a question mark on what we're heading into now. So I think data is everything, but it's also nothing. To my point before, a lot of people don't understand what it is. It's kind of in the background. You can work in any industry. You can work in any department. I've been in marketing departments. I've been in finance departments. I've been in tech departments, and I've been in departments that are specifically analytics. I think that's a good and a bad thing. I love variety, I love change. So for me, a lot of that's good, but it does end up resulting in people seeing you as kind of a supporting role. Um, unless you actually work for a business that does analytics consulting, you're usually seen as sort of a side part of the business. It's often isolated. I One of the stories I love telling is actually going to visit a, a marketing agency and I'm not kidding here, they had a whole floor of an office building and they were walking me around to show, show me their, their building. And I got to a part where the space was really open. Um, a lot of it hadn't been built out, but with these super high cubicle walls, it was like this funny little cubicle city. And the person leading me around said, oh, that's where our analytics people sit. You couldn't see them. It was just this big isolated area. I was like, oh, okay. Um, it was a very visual, and I wish I'd taken a picture. I don't think back then we actually had phones on our cam, um, cameras on our phones or even mobile phones, but a picture of that would have been great. Um, and, you know, as part of being isolated, you know, part of the reason we get pushed to the corner is because we're often not associated with strong communication skills. We're not thought of as people who are very knowledgeable about the business. And really, we're rarely ever represented in the C-suite until now. So I, um, I've had two, well, three C-level titles in my career, but one of them was CEO of my own company of four people. So that one maybe doesn't count, but twice I've actually had a C-level title. Um, 
including it right now. The term chief data officer, uh, I actually did some Google research. I had not heard it very much until very, very recently. Apparently it first appeared in the early 2000s, but you could count the number of people who had it on you know, not very many hands. The C Chief Data Officer Club was founded in 2011. They, they mentioned they had a summit in 2013, but only a few hundred people globally had the title. But now they, they claim they have thousands of members and they're holding summits all over the place. Uh, I can't wait actually till travel starts again. I can go to the, the summit in Egypt for chief data officers or in London. What this is to me is really a chance for us to start being a lot more clear about what role we have in a business. Stop writing waves of buzzwords like Six Sigma, artificial intelligence, big data, but actually have this become a core discipline that people understand and appreciate. I think we're moving in that direction. It excites me that we're moving in that direction because I think that's what's required to have a seat at the table. You actually need to have a discipline where everyone understands what you bring to the table. It also, you know, thanks to all the books out there on how data analytics has revolutionized businesses. I've listed a few here that I've read. Um, I don't know if anyone saw the movie for Moneyball for the Oakland A's. Uh, there's a good book about Harris and how analytics changed their business. So all of this is sort of coming together to give much more people, including hopefully at some point my parents, a better idea of what it is that I do. So I've talked a bit about how you talk about what it is I do. Um, I generally, if a hairdresser or you know someone I meet on the street asks me, I, I will say I'm a statistician, but it, I, I would claim it's a little misleading. My background in statistics and what I learned in academics, it basically was the science of looking at really super clean data where everyone knew what every variable was. Um, which really isn't something I do much of these days. Uh, but what I did learn in being a statistician was an understanding of, of variation and noise and how that clouds our ability to look at things. So it's not a bad thing necessarily to start by looking at clean, well-defined data, um, because then you can focus in on things like separating signal from noise. But the reality of what I do and what I have done my whole career, which I, I actually am more likely to call analytics, is that most of my time is spent and my team's times are spent cleaning and defining the data, defining the problem that actually needs to be solved, um, and actually going back and forth. Uh, I love Jill's example about working with product. Um, you have to work very closely with product and technology to make sure that when people build things that they're actually collecting data, naming it properly, collecting it properly, connecting it properly so that it can be analyzed. And a lot of the time of my team is spent running around trying to make sure that happens. By the time you actually get to looking at the data, um, you do use some statistical tools, I'd say linear logistic regression, clustering, um, there's quite a few things I've used a fair bit in my career. Uh, the particular technique I did my PhD on, I have sadly yet to find an application in the real world, but one day maybe. Some of the techniques are more empirical. Some are very visual. Some of them are just about looking at data. So a lot of what you do in analytics isn't actually things that I learned in my many degrees. I think the opportunity is huge. We've never had so much data. To Jill's point, it's going to become the edge. It's when so many other things are so easily replicable, data and understanding data is something that can put you ahead and put you ahead in a way that is very hard to catch up. As I mentioned, people who do it, you can't necessarily just go to school and learn analytics. In my experience, certainly 80% of what I do and what I know, I learned working, not at school. And even of people who have PhDs in the area, being really strong at analytics, I, th I find rare. Like somebody who really, um, and I hate to use buzzwordy terms, but I think of it almost like a data whisperer, someone who can pull, pull 
insights and stories out of data. Being good at that is quite rare. And then being able to take what you learned and communicate it and convince people to do things different is even rarer. So you think about becoming something really, really rare, and that's obviously you know your chance to become your own personal unicorn. So just to close things up, um, just a bit about what you should actually do to actually seize this opportunity if this excites you. And I will say that one thing about my career is I've loved every minute of it. Every horrible data set, every, every uh, challenging time that I had to convince somebody that something that was directional, the problem with directional is it can change directions. So you don't wanna build a lot of your business on directional results, that sort of thing. But I've loved every minute of it. So if you're interested in doing things like this, Sitting in your analytics role, I would suggest you take every chance to learn what it is the business does, how it works, how the data connects to it, listening to other business functions, spending time with them, asking lots of questions. Don't be afraid to ask a dumb question. I, I will say that coming from an academic background, I had to overcome a dislike of asking dumb questions, of feeling that it would make me look dumb, but it if you're asking a dumb question, there's a good chance a lot of other people in the room have the same question, and it's the only way to learn. Um, and then when you've done all this, you've listened, you've asked questions, link that back to the data that you are looking at and make those connections because that's the most valuable thing. And work on your communication skills. So listening, not making your communication all about buzzwords and complicated words to make yourself look smart and the people you're talking to feel dumb. Like just really work on becoming good at communicating and even throw in some things like drama, special interest clubs. I had a friend who did Toastmasters, all sorts of things to, to get better at, at making connections with people. So am I saying technical skills aren't that important? I, I think they are, but they're table stakes. So if I put out an advertisement that I want to hire a data scientist, I get buried in applications. I do not see a shortage of people who have the technical qualifications to be a data scientist. But when I sort through those applications, I see a real shortage of ones who've got solid work experience show they can integrate into a business, can communicate, and actually work in a business on analytics problems. So I do agree with Gilles. I think businesses that succeed in the future that are hard to replace will have to be data-driven. And I think there's a real opportunity to make a difference in business and become a C-level person to actually be able to drive businesses, which I find super exciting. I will warn you though, I told you I love my job, but it is hard work. It's mostly thankless and visible. And when you do get your big result, it often looks easy to other people, but just keep going. So attend meetings like this one, find the people who have the jobs you'd like, introduce yourselves to them. I'll leave this uh, presentation, but basically connect, network, and uh, reach out to me. Love to do coffee sometime. I love meeting other analytics people. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Burnham, for inspiring us to bring something to the table and be that voice as data practitioners for the organization or for our community. Um, thank you to the rest of the keynote speakers here for sharing their vision and expertise and for building a community around data that allows innovation and inspiration to create a better future with data. Big thank you to our gold sponsors this year, Accenture, Bright Data, Disco, Cascada, and Maria DB. Our silver sponsors, Dell Boomi, Oracle, MySQL, and Signify Technology. To our attendees today, we have a whole day full of great contents and sessions, panels, and startup showcase. Thank you for being here and enjoy your day one of DataCon LA 2021. Thanks, Dimas. Thank you. Thank you.